Thank you for choosing our 11 a.m. service. As we all know, summer schedule, we have only two services, 9.30 and 11 a.m. So that uh, the rest of the day, you could spend time with your family, go out. But thank God, don't miss church. How are you doing today? Well, we just want to give an honor to our young people. I heard you had an awesome, great Youth Sunday last Sunday. Let's give it up for our kids. Let's give it up for Pastor Ariel for preaching a powerful message. Awesome. Well, we're starting a new series today. It's called Freedom in Christ. Everybody say with me, Freedom in Christ. So this month of July, we're going to talk about how are we freed in Christ or how we could be set free in Christ. And today, I want to talk about breaking free from bad labels. Everybody say with me, breaking free from wrong labels. I just want you to watch this intro for today. Let's just watch this. some labels with me today. Imagine this. You go to grocery store, Safeway, Fred Meyer, and you're looking for a can of sardines, and when you get to that grocery store, there's no labels. There's no labels on the cans. You just have to guess. if It's, it's, it's going to be weird, right? In totally unacceptable. Labels are very, very important. Speaking of labels, did you know today we're going to honor our graduates? Anybody in the house who graduated this year? We have special gifts for all of you. Now, the first label that I have, do we have any honor roll among our students? If you are an honor roll, you belong to the honor roll society, don't be ashamed, don't be shy, raise your hands. Any honor roll? This year, 40 years ago doesn't count. That's a horror roll. No, just kidding. No honor roll at Charisma. It's okay. We love you even if you don't get honors. How about this? When you were growing up, you were called a bonsai. Bonsai in the house. Oh, stand up. Come on. Claim your label for today. It's my wife. Come on, tell everybody why, why this, why, what's this label that you're carrying? <laughs> the shortest in the school. Now, I have to define this. This person, the only time a girl will approach you is when he needs something to be updated in your software, in your computer, in your iPhone. Is there any geek in the house? Oh, <laughs> come on, man. Come on. Congratulations, man. Hey, 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 guys, guys. You know, you know those gigs? Don't belittle them. Later on, you'll be working for them. Right? What about this? Miss Edmonds. Is there a beauty contest finalist in? Wow. Step up to the plate. She's Melanie Ann Harry, representing us, Miss Edmonds. This coming October, she will be competing for Miss Washington. So proud of you. What about this? Short. This could mean a lot, short of cash. <laughs> okay, mommy, my mom is short. Ask your husband to help you out. 
So labels are very, very important, as you could see. We have fun in the house. But what about this? What if the label that you carry is negative? Is that honorable? Is that Miss Edmonds? Is that geek? It's about being a drug addict. You know, when I was growing up, this is one of the labels that I carry. I, I, was, I was lost, I was looking for self-esteem is down and anything, so I want approval from others and do what everything they're doing. Started with the gateway drug, the marijuana, then all to those uppers, downers, so I was a drug addict. And you know, when I was carrying that label, the next label that I carry is they call me trash. I'm wasted. I must come of the earth. I'm doing drugs. I'm trash. And most of the time, I hear this label being put on me. Hey, stupid, come here. I'm trash, I'm stupid, I'm a drug addict. So this label I carry in my life brings all the negative emotion in the inside of me. Well, today I'd like to introduce to you to a person. She is a woman unnamed. The Bible never mentioned her name. And she carries a lot of bad labels. Let's put it on the screen and let's read it all together. This is the woman of Samaria. Let's all stand up in honor of God's word, charisma. Let's all read this together. The woman surprised that a Jew would ask despise Samaritan for anything. Usually they wouldn't even speak to them. And she remarked about this to Jesus. He replied, if you only knew what a wonderful gift God has for you and who I am, you would ask me for some living water. And all of God's people said, before you sit down, everybody say, today's the day I made my choice. You will make the change. I'm nothing without you, but with you I have everything. I am not who people say I am. I am who Jesus says I am, that I am created for a purpose, that I am not a trash, that I am not an accident. I am perfectly and wonderfully made, and you have a plan for me, Lord, and my past does not disqualify me for your plans. It is good, it's full of hope, and it's blessed days, and the best days are ahead of me for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people say, let's give the Lord a clap of praise. <laughs> Amen. So you can now be seated. So this woman, you look to see the labels that she carried, despise. She's part of the despicable me because she was a woman. Back in the day, if you're a woman, you are despised, you are second class. If you are walking in a public street, even you are with your husband, you cannot hold hands with your husband because you're a woman. You need to be walking in front of your husband, uh, behind your husband, at least two steps behind because you're just a woman. And to make the matter worse, not just a woman, she's Samaritan. We need to understand the context. Back in the day, intercultural marriage is not accepted. Multi-ethnic marriage is not accepted. If you are a Jew, you marry a Jew. If you're a Gentile, you marry a Gentile. Samaritans are half-breeds. Now it's cool, it's accepted. But back in the day, half-breeds is a no-no. Half-Jews and half Assyrians, they called themselves Samaritans. And here comes Jesus coming out to a woman and talking to a Samaritan woman. It's totally unacceptable. That's why the woman was shocked. Said, why would a Jew would ask a despised 
That's a label, Samaritan. So let me just ask you today, this is a very important question, wear your thinking cap today. Who has the right to label something? Who has the right to label something? There are three entities or people that have the right to label something. Number one, the maker. Everybody say the maker. maker. Or you might call it the manufacturer. Look at the back of your t-shirt or your shirt or your clothes. You would see the maker. Or sometimes they put it in front of you, the logo, the maker. They have the right to do that because they made it. They manufacture it. The maker has the right to label something. What about this? The owner. Everybody say the owner. The owner. The owner has the right to label something. This way, some, back in the day, you will see those houses. You will see the name on their, uh, what you call that? The mailings. The, the, the one that put on the, front, on the front, forts or what, what you call this? The mailbox, or they put it on their front uh, fort, residence of Reyes, because they own it. Wouldn't it be weird if I come to your house with a label maker and I started labeling stuff in your house, dog food, underwear drawer, TV, sofa, Toilet. I may be right putting the right label, but I don't have the right to do that because I'm not the owner. I'm just a guest. I just sit there and wait for you to call me to come and eat. I don't even have the right to open your refrigerator because I'm just a guest. You know who has the right to label something? The maker, the owner. What about this? The buyer. The buyer has the right to label something. Kids, remember what your parents would say when you get the nice backpack? Put your... When you get those new lunch bag, write your name on it. If you're playing sports, you have your baseball bat, you put your name on it. Your sneakers, you put your name. You have the right because you bought it. You were the buyer. Labels are very powerful. I want you to listen closely because, listen to this charisma, labels lock you in and lack opportunity out. Everybody say, labels lock you in and labels lock opportunity out. How many of you, maybe you were unemployed, maybe you were let go, and you know you're good, and you know you have a title, and you know you're up to. But because of that label that you carry, sometimes there are missed opportunities in your life because you're carrying that label. I'm not getting a job. I'm not, it's hard for me now. Oh, it's, I'm old. I'm too young. And you carry that label. It locks you in and opportunity out too. Wrong label can lock you in and lock God out. What happened to this woman? Here's Jesus Christ. He is God out of his way, coming to a Samaria, offering the free drink of the living water. And the woman said, excuse me, you're talking to me. I'm a Samaritan woman. Not me. Not me, Jesus. You're for the Jews. It lacked in the opportunity for this woman at first. Then listen to me carefully. Labors, labels determine how you see yourself and how you see the world around you. It's all about perspective. When you wake up this morning, you say, I see stars, blue stars, blue skies. Oh, what do you sing? How do you sing that, Royal? I see stars, star. Can you help me out? I see stars are blue, the skies are white. Stars are blue? What a, and I say to myself, what a wonderful world. It's a perspective. But if you wake up in the morning, I see traffic jam, <laughs> annoying people, and I'm still single. 
looking for a date. <laughs> and I think to myself, what a horrible world. <laughs> and sometimes, because of what you see and how you feel. And I, I'm not belittling people. Please don't get me. this. Look at me. I'm wearing my labels. I'm wearing it. I'm not proud about it, but this was me. I carried this label for so many times. Now, here's the thing, charisma. When you got this label, and this is, I think, one of the worst labels you might carry, is this called the approval addict. And I was guilty of this and a prisoner of being an approval addict. You know what's an approval addict? Read it on the screen. Constantly worry about what others might be. When you always think, what will my parents say? What will my homie say? What will my church say? What will my friend say? What will other people say? If you are that, always thinking of what people will say. Your decision is the disease to please others. You might be an approval addict. You might be an approval addict if I do, I do not do certain things because other people may not approve. Let's read it, Charisma. I do not do certain things because other people may not be. This is now you have the groupie mentality. You now the herd mentality. Whatever the group uh, will do, will just follow the crowd. You become like a chameleon. Kama, 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 chameleon. You become like that. You blend into whatever the crowd say because you don't want to be far out. You don't want to be standing out. You just do certain things so that you'll be in the crowd. And a lot of young kids going to school because of peer pressure, giving in so that they'll be cute, so they'll be like, so they'll be accepted to become popular. That's an approval addict. And number three is not only that, you constantly recite criticism in your head. I was guilty of that, let me tell you. As a pastor, I will be preaching every weekend, and I'll try my best to preach, to, to, to bless people, to heal people, to be a channel of healing. And people will come up to me, Pastor, you make me cry. Pastor, that was awesome. Pastor, that's anointed. And 10 people probably just praised me and uh, commended me for my sermon. And one person said, you know you have a wrong grammar. You know your accent is too Filipino. And I'm telling you, I will, not, I will forget all those 10 commendations, and I will just focus on that. I'm not a good speaker. I have a bad English. I have a Filipino accent. And my day will be ruined because it's like a broken record looping thoughts going throughout my head because I wasn't able to please that one person. Number four, I get anxious when I think someone might be upset with me. Before, if somebody gets upset with me, I cannot go to bed. I have to write an email. I have to text, to call, or meet that person, somebody. Come on, like me. Come on, accept me. Come on, tell me I'm okay. Please tell me, okay, okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. Please tell me I'm okay. Or I will, no, 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 no. And number five, I can say no to people even if it costs the people who deeply care about me. And I was guilty of this. I get so many, of course, invitation, party here, party there, go there. But sometimes I cannot go to every party. I cannot go to every visitation. I cannot go to every life group. I cannot go to every Bible study. And sometimes I overstress myself and I lost my time with the precious people that loves me more deeply. It's my own family. Amen. And I could tell you now, I have been delivered from that. Our staff knows, our leaders know. We have a staff meeting. Oh, I forget. My daughter is performing today at the orchestra at the school. Okay, pastor, just go to your daughter's 
orchestra performance, and I love them, and they, they understand. Listen to me carefully. I have only 18 years of my life with my daughters, and hopefully longer, because I know someday they'll go to school, or someday they will go to college. These precious 18 years that I have them in my arm, in my hand, I make sure that I'll make memories with them. Because at the end of the day, it will just be me, Sharon, and my kids, and my family. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I challenge you. We are a church that we're not overextending you, overstretching you out. That's why I challenge you. Summer, go to church in the morning, 9.30, 11. Then, then go out with your family. Explore Washington. It's beautiful. And sometimes, do you do this? When you say no, you tell a lie to make an alibi. <laughs> so you'll be approved. So you won't get people that offended you. I'm sorry, I cannot make it because uh, 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 I'm sick. <laughs> I'm tired. Egg of you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, this is what happened to the woman. She has a lot of issues. You know what Tim Keller said? Tim Keller said, she's medicating her mess with men because she's longing for approval and acceptance with men, and she's been through five divorces now, this woman, just because she has a disease to please, she has a need to be accepted. And all the approval that she's longing for cannot be found in men. And sometimes reality is hard to take, but speak the truth in love. Let's read this. This is Jesus speaking. I want you to read this with me. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is what? You had five. And now the one you have is not your what you have just said is quite true. I want you to watch a short video clip with me about a relationship struggle. I'm sure you heard this woman from your man, or you heard this man from the woman. Don't fix me. Just try to listen. Let's watch this. This is funny. It's just there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. Yeah, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! If, if you, you would, would just, just don't. Try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking to? Go on, church, lighten up. <laughs> The woman <laughs> has an obvious problem, <laughs> but she's either denying it, and this woman has a big problem because of what she's been through, and here comes Jesus approaching, confronting him, her with that issue. Now, I want to ask you this question, but don't answer it. Just contemplate. I know it will be hard for you, some women, but hold your peace. Who has 
the right to label you. Who has the right to label you? Based on the description I said earlier, who has the right to label things, it's the same principle who has the right to label you. Number one, the only person who has the right to label you, the one who made you. Charisma, do you know who made you? Yes. Let's all read this together. And God made man in his own likeness. In the likeness of God, he made him. He bo made both male. Who has the right to label you? The maker. The one who made you. Who has the right to label you? The one who owns you. The owner. Listen to what the Bible says. Let's read it together, Charisma. The earth is the Lord's. And everything in it, the world. And all, everybody say all. all. You know the word all in the Hebrew? All. And that all it means. Who has the right to label you? The one who made you and the one who owns you. Number three, who has the right to label you? The one who bought you. If a buyer has the liberty and right to label something, do you know who bought you? Let's read this together, Charisma. I want you to read this with me. Do you not know that your body is a house of God where the Holy Spirit lives? God gave His Holy Spirit. Now you belong to God. You do not belong to yourselves. God bought you with a great price. So honor God with your body because you belong to Him. Tell the person next to you, these bods belong to God. Amen. Amen. That's when you don't want to desecrate it. You want to abuse it. You don't want to misuse it. This body belongs to God. He dwells in this body. The Holy Spirit, when you became a Christian, the, the fullness of God came into you. That's why God says you belong to God and you were bought with a great price. How much did he pay for you? Listen to this, Charisma. You know you were not bought and made free from sin by paying gold or silver, which comes to an end. And you know you were not saved from the punishment of sin by the way of life that was worth nothing. The blood of Christ saved you. The blood is of great worth and no amount of money could buy it. Christ was given as a lamb without sin and without... Who has the right to label you? The one who made you. The one who owns you. And the one who bought you. So you feel good about yourselves. The only one who has the right to label you is Jesus. And this woman carries a lot of labels. Woman, despised, divorced, five times, living in with a man. Imagine all the issues that this woman is carrying. But Jesus did not call her with names like that. Listen to this encounter with Jesus. Let's unlock this. You know what I learned in life? Every one of us has baggage. Every one of us. Some are big, some are, some are short, some are large, some of you are carrying extra. All of us have baggages. You need to find someone who loves you and cares enough for you who will help you unpack with your baggage. And I have good news for you. Jesus is the greatest baggage handler. And Jesus is the greatest bondage breaker. He can set you free from those labels. Come on, somebody. Amen. The first thing you want to understand is this. Amen. Let's give it to Jesus. If you want to clap to Jesus, amen. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Jesus knows where you are. Everybody say, Jesus knows where you are. That's somebody saying, Jesus knows where you are. 
I want you to read this with me. John 4, 4. Now we had to go through Samaria, so we come, came to a town called Sychar. We need to understand geography. Jerusalem is up. And the surrounding communities and uh, regions down. And you know, for our devout Jews, they, they go to the mountain to go to Jerusalem as a pilgrimage, so as their, their worship. And there's a short route going to Jerusalem, but you have to pass by Samaria. No devout Jew will step foot on the land of Samaria because they are despised. They're half-breeds. They are not like us. They don't belong to us. They have no right. So what they'll do, they'll travel far just to avoid this city. But Jesus is not an approval addict. He is not acting according to the norm of the, of the society. He went there to Samaria. Listen to me carefully. That is the difference between Christianity and religion. Religion is you're trying to go up to the mountain to God with your good works and your do this, do this, do that. That's religion. Jesus Christ came down from heaven to earth and met you where you are. At Samaria, where the despicable man lives. Jesus went there at her hiding place. Where was this woman? I want you to understand, tell this person next to you, your location is God's location. If your body is the house of God, is your body the house of God? So nowhere you you could go without God with you. Because you cannot go without your body, right? Wherever you go, you carry your body with you. And God lives in the body. He's the Holy Spirit in the inside of you. So wherever you go, God goes with you. I could say to you, go ahead. I'll meet you there. But God will not say, go ahead, I'll meet you there. Let's go together in this journey you're going through. I am with you. Because your location is God's location. And not only that, Jesus understands your pain. This is very powerful, church. Everybody say, Jesus understands my pain. He was not there to label and put this on this woman and call in her name. No, he understood her pain. Let's read this together, Charisma. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from a long walk, sat beside the well about noontime. Soon, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. There is a well. Picture this in your mind. The well back in the day is like Starbucks where people hang out, drink their coffee, socialize. Back in the day, the well is like Starbucks. People go there to pick a a bucket of water and they socialize there. They talk around the well. And this woman went there at noontime. You know why at noontime? Because she's despicable. She's despised. Married five times, divorced, and living in with another man. Could you imagine? It's a small town. Oh, look at that woman. Oh, she's been with Roger. She's been with Max. Oh, she's been with, uh, with this guy. Oh, now she's living with another person. Imagine all the ridicule, and she's reviled. So instead of going in the morning or evening... She went there at noontime. Why? It's a desert. You know, last week, 90 degrees. It was so hot for us Seattleites, right? Imagine you're living in the desert at noontime, probably 100 degrees, and it's hot. It's arid. It's dry. But the woman went there because she doesn't want to associate with people. She's not welcome. Listen to me carefully. This is Christianity. Jesus was there waiting for the woman. Listen to me carefully. This is not religion. This is Christianity. Jesus made the first move. He started the conversation. Please give me a drink. I was just imagining this woman while speaking of the water and heard a stranger, woman, please give me a drink. At the back of her mind, oh, I heard that line before. Here's another man. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man, another man. But this time, This is not just a man. 
This is Jesus, the ultimate man, God in the flesh, going out of his way to go out to this despised city to meet a despised woman because Jesus knows her pain. Everybody say this with me. Your pain is God's pain. Let's make this personal. Say it with me. My pain is God's pain. Remember what Isaiah said? Surely he born and carried our sorrows. Jesus is not out of the picture. He became flesh. And he carried all the issues of the flesh. He carried all the, the pain. And listen to this verse. I want you to understand this conversation. Let's, the woman replied, let's read together. Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the? Everybody say, the well is deep. The well is deep. It is like a metaphor. You know what this woman is saying? You really want to know me? You want to have a relationship with me? You don't, you're barking on the wrong tree. Do you know who I am? I'm a woman and a and, 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 and lot of issue. I have a well so deep. I have some issues upon layer, of layer, of layer of issues. Listen to me carefully. Jesus wants to go to the deepest longing of your heart. Jesus did not come just to put band-aids on your wounds. Jesus came to set you free and heal your broken heart. Come on, somebody. Because Jesus understands our pain. He knows when you're lonely and sad. He knows when you're looking on the wall and staring in the middle of the night and asking questions and confused. He knows that. He feels that. Because your pain is God's pain. You know why could I say this? Listen to me carefully. Let's read this together in Hebrews 4.15. Can we put it on the screen? Let's read it together, Charisma 1, 2, 3. Jesus understands every weakness of ours because he was tempted in every way the way we are. But he, so he knows there. He got it. He gets it. He feels it. Number three, Jesus offers hope. I want you to read this together. One, two, three. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I should give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Everybody say, whoever. This is the key word in this verse. That's why it's twice mentioned. Everybody say, whoever. And I want you to shout it out. One, two, three, and say, I am a whoever. One, two, three. Everybody, one, two, three. Did you notice that? For us, wow, it's liberating. How much more to them? Because Jews and Samaritans, they don't associate. And Jesus says, whoever, it's for all. This is not just for the Jews. This is not an exclusive right. It's whoever. Jesus is the God of the whoever. Whoever comes to him and drink of his life, giving water and everlasting life because Jesus offers so. Last but not the least, say this with me. Jesus will complete you. Listen to this conversation. So remember this. The, the woman said, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Let's read what Jesus said. Let's, re let's read together. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Remember how many husbands did the woman have before? Five. And she's living with another Man, and he's talking to another man. Who is the seventh man in, his, in her life? What's the number seven? The perfect man, the ultimate man. It's a number of completion. What Jesus was telling to this woman, you've been moving around, 
You've been living and you've been searching for the longing and acceptance and approval from men and medicating your mess by approving the disease to please me. Let me tell you this. I am He. Listen to me carefully. When you have Jesus, you're complete. I will say it again. When you have Jesus, you're complete. Don't listen to this label. Oh, you cannot, you're not going to get married. You cannot produce a baby. Oh, you're not going to have this. Oh, you're divorcing. Oh, you're that, you're that. Listen to me carefully. When you have Jesus, you're complete. Jesus complete me. No other man can complete you except, except Jesus Christ. And now here is the life application for us today. I like this story. I call this story from damaged goods to trophy of grace. She considered her life as a damaged goods. She's been damaged big time. But she became a trophy of grace. Now let's listen. After the encounter with the woman, with Jesus, what happened to the woman? Let's read this together. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed. Because of what? Did you notice? The one who was despised, the one who was reviled, the one who was ridiculed, now she's delivering testimony. I like the word reviled. Maybe you're reviled, but if you read it backward, it's deliver. Yes. This woman was reviled of the town and outcast, but Jesus came to her and changed the words of the meaning of reviled and read it backward. She's been delivered. Charisma, listen to me carefully. Evangelism is so simple. Some of you are afraid to tell others about Jesus. Evangelism is simple. This woman did not go to Bible school right after she met Jesus. Hey, come meet a man who doesn't discriminate. Hey, come meet a man who did not judge me because I was a divorcee. Hey, come meet a man who accepted me just as I am and forgave me of my sin. Come meet a man who loves us, whoever. And the people in Samaritan, whoa, what? A Jew came to town and asked you for a drink of water and offer you everlasting life. And now you're changed. You see the glow in her face. You see the joy, the, the, the lips on, on her steps. I want to meet that man. Many of the Samaritans from that town believe in him because of the woman's testimony. Now listen to me carefully, Charisma. Uh, they could call you names. Please, don't quarrel with them. Don't fight with them. They could call you as much as they can. But as long as you don't call yourself that name that they're calling you, you'll be okay. Because you are not what people says you are. Yes. You are what you answer to their call. They call me trash before, but you know what? My God is in the recycling business. Amen. And he recycled a trash. Amen. Trophy of God's grace. And he anointed me and appointed me. Now I'm a pastor for the living God. Amen. They can call you names. They call me a drug addict. Let me tell you this. I'm still an addict today. I'm addicted to Jesus. This is now my drink. This is now my drug. I read this line by line. Precept by precept. Chapter by chapter. And it gets me high. And there's no high like the most high. They could call me names. I'm an addict for Jesus. Listen to me carefully. That's what set me free. I'm a product of my past, but no longer a prisoner of my past because I met a, a person by the name of Jesus who did not label me for all those labels that they put on me. Isaiah 54, 7 says, verse 17 says, no weapon, let's read this together, Charisma. No weapon formed against you will prevail. You will refute every tongue that accuses you. 
This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. This is the vindication from the one from that declares the Lord. Everybody say, no weapon formed against me. Now let me ask you the question. Who will rebuke or stop those name calling that they have put on you? Is it God or you? Who is it God or you? Is it God or you? Not God, you. Listen, no weapon formed against you will prevail. And you, everybody say you. you. Everybody say you. you. Everybody say me. me. They will call you names. They will call you names. They will call you names. But don't call you that name that they've been calling you. Rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Don't own it. Cancer is a sickness. Yes, it is. But don't own it. Just say, this cancer, this cancer will pass. This issue will pass. This addiction will pass. And I rebuke that in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm not a loose woman anymore or promiscuous of what they call me. I'm the daughter of the king. You say it. You rebuke it. You repute it. You're the one who's going to say that. That's what the Bible says. Because there's power in the words. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, not enough, but by the word of their testimony. What is this woman doing? He was testimony, testifying about the man he just met. The man who set him free. His name is Jesus Christ. Now look what happened next. Then they said to the woman, let's read together. Then they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. We know the man is really... Stand up on your feet and read this with me as we prepare for communion. Let's read this together, Charisma. We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard ourselves. And we know that this man really is charisma. Can you make this a covenant with your pastor today? Commitment. Can we tell others about Jesus? Charisma, can we tell others about Jesus? Charisma, I'm challenging you. Can we tell others about Jesus? If the gay community can come out of the closet and proclaim their, their so-called freedom, if they could come out, I'm not against that. They want, they want that they're, they're just, that's, their, uh, that's their right. Christians, can we come out of our closet? Come on, somebody. Christians, can we come out of our closet and not be a secret agent Christian and tell other people, this Jesus that you thought is a religious guy, this Jesus that you thought is a judgmental guy, this Jesus that you thought that's out to get you, to murder you. No, he's good. He's God. He wants to set you free. He wants to give you the best of your life for the rest of your life. This woman became an evangelist. Just tell what happened to her. Now look what happened to the town. We no longer believe just because you said. There will come a time, people will no longer believe just because you said. They will experience Jesus for themselves. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you want that? That your friends will tell you, hey, I don't just believe what you said. I know now. I experienced Jesus. He is really the Savior of the world. Charisma, who has the right to label you? Who has the right to label you? Who has the right to label you? For the last time, who has the right to label you? Yes. This is why we're called Christians. Christ in us. That's my label. And without Christ, I'm Ian. I am nothing. Who has the right to label me? The one who made me. The one who owns me and the one who bought me. 
I'm not a thrush. I'm not a jerk. I'm not a scum of the earth. I'm not worthless. Jesus died for me. Jesus gave his life for me. He paid it with his own blood. And today as we celebrate communion, as the ushers will come, I want all of us to participate and receive this. This is how much you are valued and how important you are. Jesus made you, owns you, and bought you with His own body, with His own blood. Remain standing as the ushers are coming and let's just celebrate Jesus today.